My name is Ulf Adams, and I'm a TL for Google's build system called Bazel. In a recent developer survey, we found out that the majority of Google developers, their number one request is faster builds. And over 90% of them also agree that fast builds are important for high development velocity. Take a look at this slide. Every dot here represents a million lines of code. So when we talk about build performance, we also talk about code size. And the larger the project, you know, it magnifies the effects that you can already see on, on small code bases. The challenge about working for Google is that Google's code base <laughs> is kind of large. Actually, it's pretty large. <laughs> you might even say that it's excessively large. So how, do, how long do you think does it take to build all of this software? Now, we have a continuous integration system, CI for short, and it runs tests where running the test on a single machine doesn't take longer than 15 minutes. And it can run 90% of the tests in less than an hour. Now, the remaining 10% take a little bit longer, but that seems pretty cool. Of course, teams at Google can also run integration tests that take longer than 15 minutes or that need more than one machine. But we do encourage our developers to get at least basic coverage on the CI system. From a build system perspective, our approach is, if it's not on CI, it's not our problem. So we looked at a lot of different projects, and we analyzed their performance, and we made a lot of changes to the compilers, to the code, to the build system. And the number one issue we found was build and test times that are super linear in the size of the project. And I want to take a look at an example. This is the time, this graph shows the time required by the Clang C++ compiler to compile a single source file as the number of includes and the number of include directories goes up. As you can see, it goes up by the third power. Now, at least part of the reason for that is that the C++ compiler, every time it sees an include, it scans through the list of include directories, which is sort of inefficient. Um, but this is just sort of a constructed example. I got these numbers on my machine. I knew exactly how I was constructing the, the, the case to expose this problem. Um, so does it really happen in practice? Let me share a story about a problem that we had at Google a couple years ago. Back in 2010, we started a project to improve C++ build performance, codename Hydrazine, which is a rocket fuel. And we went about this very methodically. We first wanted to measure and analyze the build performance. And then afterwards, we also wanted to make sure that all the changes we made actually improved performance across all of Google, not just in a specific benchmark. And so the first thing we did was build infrastructure to collect actual performance numbers. And then we looked at options, and we built some prototypes. And we made some changes that actually did improve build performance but not quite as good as we had hoped for. Ultimately, we concluded that includes in C++ are an unsolvable problem, well, without C++ language changes. Fast forward to 2014. This is the actual average compile time for a source file at all, you know, across all of Google. The timeline is approximate, but as you can see, Towards the end of 2014, the time went up like a rocket. Um, over a couple of months, the time increased by a factor of nine. Houston, we have a problem. So some background is in order. Google extensively uses protocol buffers, protobuf for short, um, to store and exchange information. Really, any time we store our exchange information, we use protobufs for that. And protobufs are written in a protocol description language, uh, and they then get compiled to any number of actual programming languages, among which is C++. And the tool to do that is called the protocol compiler. So back then, the protocol compiler generated code that 
look kind of like this. Um, and there are two distinctive features here. First, if one protobuf definition references another one, then the generated header file for the first one includes the generated header file for the second. And the second distinctive property here is that the protocol compiler was written to emit a lot of functions in the header file to support inlining. Protobufs are often used in performance critical code at Google, and so inlining significantly, can significantly improve the performance of the, of the code at runtime. Now, the problem is that whenever you include one of these header files in your program, the C++ compiler has to read the, the entire transitive closure of these header files, which are also very large because of all of the inline methods. So we made a change and we made inlining optional. So we used a symbol, and if that symbol is set at compile time, then the compiler can see the inline methods, and if it's not set, then it, it skips them. And so when you do a developer build, uh, the symbol is not set, so you have a fast build, and if you build for production, it's set, so you get fast runtime in production. And we got down the, the build time, so that's great. Well, not so much. Turns out, in a couple of months after that, we discovered that the build times were still going up like a rocket. So back to the drawing board. Um, as I said earlier, the problem is twofold. One is the size of the header files, and we sort of got that under control, but the other is the recursive includes, and that's still a problem. And so we made a second change. Instead of recursively including the, the header files from the dependencies, we used forward declaration of the necessary symbols. Now, the problem with that approach is it also requires changes to the source files. Right? If previously, if you were including foo.pb.h, you could access all of the symbols from bar, and now that's no longer the case. So we also had to go in and update all of the source code to include bar.pb.h if and only if those symbols are required for the compilation. And we did, and compile times went down again. Now, they didn't quite go down as far as it was before, because we're still seeing super linear scaling. But the majority of the problem here was because the protocol compiler generated code that induced superlinear scaling in the C++ compiler. And so we got that fixed. OK. <laughs> so we concluded that superlinear scaling is real. Now, as a build system engineer, um, I'm neutral on the question of which language you should use for your work. We're, we're here to help people get their job done and not to berate them for their language choices. So given that a lot of languages exhibit this problem, what can we do about that? So there are three areas where we can make changes. First, the compiler, and I already went through a kind of extensive example. Um, I'm only going to give a couple of pointers uh, for you to, to look into this if you're interested. Uh, second, we can change the code, and I want to briefly talk about how code organization affects build and test times. And third, of course, the build system. And I want to briefly talk about what the build system can and should do to reduce build times. Now, I'm distinguishing between compilers and the build system here, not because they are necessarily distinct binaries, but because they have very different tasks, conceptually different tasks. So from our point of view, the build system is language independent. It figures out what to run, how to run it, and where to run it, but that doesn't itself read source files or generate output files. So we looked at a lot of different languages and a lot of different tools used for these languages, and pretty much for every language we looked at, we found that either the build time or the test time scaled super linearly in the project size. Now, if you're a C++ developer, I strongly encourage you to look at C++ modules. Um, they are sort of one of the results of the Hydrazine project, and they, help, they can help solve this problem for you. Uh, also, if you're a Go developer, you're in luck, because the compiler was designed from the beginning to avoid this problem. But testing, we don't know yet. All right, let's talk about code organization. Now, 
The primary reason why we see superlinear scaling is because the compiler often needs access to the transitive closure of dependencies. So if you have a code that looks like this, both building and running the tests will probably exhibit superlinear performance. Instead, what you should do is you should write small, self-contained, independently testable libraries that have easy-to-use, well-defined interfaces. Easy enough, right? Now, even if you can't, the good news is that even a small change can make a big impact because the performance is super linear. In this example, the dependency from library B to library C isn't really necessary. And by making a small code change, we can split up that dependency. And the effect is that the length of the dependency chain gets halved in this case. At Google, we've seen cases where it changes just like this, where we moved just a few methods to another library, reduced build times by 40%. So let's talk about the build system. So th this is the time needed to build Bazel, the project that I work on. Um, a clean build is basically a build from scratch, where you do everything on a single machine, and it takes about 20 minutes to build and test Bazel. Now, a null build compared to that, you can't really see anything here because it takes less than half a second. And we define a null build as a build where nothing relevant has changed since the previous build. So would you like your builds to look more like clean builds or more like null builds? Stupid question. OK. But, but then why do we use build systems that force you to do clean builds all the time? From a performance perspective, the number one task for a build system is to avoid unnecessary work. But it needs to do so carefully. If it avoids necessary work, then it also wastes time, both because of the inevitable clean build that you have to do, and also because the developer first has to figure out why the heck things aren't working as he expects. So, in order to avoid clean builds, two things have to come together. First, you need to track the input files that are necessary for the build, and you need to do so explicitly and completely. If one of them changes, you need to make sure that you redo the build. Now, that includes source files, of course, but also the compiler and the necessary system libraries and headers and pretty much any other file that is necessary for the build. And the second part that you need to take into account is the exact command line and the environment variables. Now, completely avoiding clean builds is difficult, and Bazel certainly still has a clean command. Um, and it also requires developer cooperation to declare all of these dependencies. But we believe that it's a significant win for developer productivity and happiness. Um, at Google, our goal is no clean builds ever, and we're getting reasonably close. Here is what one of our coworkers said to us recently. I was just reflecting on the fact that I've been at Google for six years, and I think I can count on one hand the number of instances where I've even considered using Bazel Clean to try to solve a build problem. So, but wait. What does that have to do with superlinear scaling? So, there is a side effect of avoiding clean builds. If you have the command line and the environment variables and you know all the files that go into it, these together form a sort of um, unit that now becomes independent of the actual machine and the actual user. And so what you can do is you can cache that uh, both locally and remotely, and you can even send that to another machine to be executed somewhere else. So for C++, we saw superlinear behavior even within a single source file, but that's a very uncommon case. What we see much more commonly is that the tools exhibit superlinear be behavior across an entire end-to-end -end build. So this analysis assumes that all of this, the entire build is done sequentially on a single CPU, but now if you can distribute the build, that analysis isn't quite accurate anymore. At the very least, 
when you distribute the build, you can scale to a much, much larger code base size. Or alternatively, you can get your build times down. So this is what it looks like um, if, you, if you take the base of build and you distribute it. Uh, it's about an order of magnitude faster than a clean build. It's still a clean build, it's just distributed across many machines. And on top of that, if you add caching to the mix, and you actually get cache hits, you get it reduced by another order of magnitude. And a common approach is to have the CI system pre-fill the remote cache, so whenever a developer syncs or pulls the latest changes, they get all cache hits. So their builds look much closer to the null build um, by two or three orders of magnitude faster than, than the clean build. To summarize, building software often runs into superlinear behavior, both for building and for testing it. The good news is we can change the compilers and we can change the code to avoid the superlinear behavior. If all else fails, you should use a build system that carefully avoids unnecessary work. It might be able to do much more aggressive caching and even distribute the build across multiple machines and make your builds much faster, at least until your code base becomes the size of Google's. So come visit us at bazel.build and discuss how we can avo avoid superlinear scaling uh, and avoid unnecessary work. Thank you very much.